Hey guys, today I am interviewing Jason Prawl from the Human Longevity Project. Uh, Jason is honestly one of my favorite people. We met down in a retreat in Costa Rica, and let me tell you a little bit about Jason. Uh, Jason's a former medical engineer turned entrepreneur, filmmaker, health educator, and practitioner. Over the last 10 years, Jason transitioned from working in the integrative disease care model to a model of health optimization and lifestyle medicine. In May of 2018, his independent research and experience as a practitioner was used as the basis for the creation of the Human Longevity Project, a nine-part documentary film series that uncovers the complex mechanisms of chronic disease and aging and the true nature of longevity in our modern world. He's currently working on his next film series that explores the ancient methods of healing, mind, body, and spirit from indigenous cultures around the world, which I cannot wait for. If you haven't seen the Human Longevity Project, I'm telling you, if you like any of the content that I put out, you will love the Human Longevity Project. I, I seriously watched that whole series with a pen in my hand and took notes. It was that good. Um, what he did was interview centenarians from all over the world, like 100-year-olds, and got their perspectives of wisdom and health, and then put that side by side of all of the experts in the health field, like all my dream players, like my dream lineup, my dream team, right? They're all in there. Such a compelling documentary with so much good information. And I just love the way he puts it side by side with wisdom and science, you know, a little bit of spiritual, a little bit of uh, cultural <laughs> with the science is so beautiful. So um, this episode, honestly, is just so good. I hope you guys really enjoy hearing from Jason. So um, let's let's get the show rolling. Here is Jason Prawl. All right, guys, I've got Jason Prawl on the other line. What's up, Jason? Hey, how are you? <laughs> Good. I am so excited for this podcast, and I kind of okay. wish we had like 10 hours to record it. <laughs> <laughs> we, and probably, we probably could use the whole, whole amount. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, guys, so here's the deal. Jason and I met last October <laughs> in Costa Rica at an ayahuasca retreat, uh, Rhythmia. And I didn't know, I didn't know who you were, Jason. All I knew was like, you were the human longevity project guy <laughs> and I hadn't seen the human longevity project. And I was just kind of like, okay. <laughs> and what, what I was most impressed with you. And I don't think I've told you this, but I kind of judge people, I guess I know, a righteous judgment. I kind of judge people's health based off not only how they look and, you know, are healthy, but also how they come across, how they are mm -hmm. in their relationships, how they treat people, how they listen. And that was what stood out to me the most about you. Like you have a very childlike almost, um, disposition and, and learning from people and listening to people. And I really think that that like is a indicator of your overall health, both spiritually and, and, uh, physically. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Wasn't always that was, uh, wasn't always that way. <laughs> okay, let's let's go. Let's go. It's eleven eleven, by the way. Let's do this. <laughs> um, um, let, how elaborate? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think for me, you know, when it, when I look back, um, first of all, I wouldn't change anything because I think it's all divinely sort of set up this way, and and and, I, and, and it led me to a beautiful place. But you know, there was in my childhood, there was a lot of I had a normal childhood, but at the same time, I had by normal, I mean you know, divorced parents and not necessarily, I mean, young parents, I think that's the most appropriate way to say it. So they didn't know maybe what they could have known if they were a little bit older about how to parent. And so those, that early childhood stuff forced me to sort of grow up quickly emotionally. And, and there was a lot of traumas, subtle traumas, you know, nothing, no abuse, no, no overt traumas that way. But those traumas and those things that I experienced in childhood basically developed a personality, right? They developed these, these personalities that get us through life. They give us these skills, right? For me, it was an amazing ability to handle things on my own because I couldn't rely on anybody else's type of thing. So, you know, those patterns and personality things that, that, that we develop and that I developed really created a, a projected form of myself, right? And so as I started to really begin to understand that, I would say in my 30s, um, you know, I was able to start to let go of some of those things, some of those patterns and some of those projections that weren't really me, that were just my patterns. And so as I was able to see those clearly and work through those um, and continue to work through those, you know, that I think that unfolded into a much more um, humble, uh, uh, less sure person um, that could be like a child, that could be inquisitive, that could be non-threatened, you know, by, by somebody else's viewpoints or somebody else's opinions or, 
anything like that. So, you know, that's really where I try to continue to go is, is, is to, uh, respect everybody's point of view to respect where they're coming from and try to see what they're saying and where it's coming from. Realizing that, you know, I don't know any more than they do. You know, we're all kind of in this game together where we're, we're, nobody's got it figured out. I think as, as Terrence McKenna likes to say, you know, and, and that's a more fun place to operate from, I think, totally. uh, because it gives you freedom to be wrong. You know, you're not put, you don't have this, this pressure put on yourself by yourself you know, to be right or to be something or to, to be successful or to, to be anything other than yourself. And so that's really where I try to continue to move toward is just to be more authentically mean, whatever comes out on the other side, you know, hopefully that's, that comes across well. Okay. So being more authentically you, you, you used to be a mechanical engineer yeah. <laughs> and yeah. now you're a filmmaker, entrepreneur in the health space. You're like a walking encyclopedia for health information. Um, and how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I really, it came down to, I was always a mechanical engineer for 10 years and, and yeah, I enjoyed it to some degree, but ultimately it was, you know, what I like to say is my, my soul started to wake me up to, to my true path. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. and that period of my life was really important to get me where I am today. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not at all what I was meant to do. So, you know, it just, what, what prompted the change was really my unhappiness, you know, unhappiness in what I was doing. And, and it didn't, it wasn't so overt, like it wasn't obvious. It was just me sort of being a little bit grumpier about life. And it just showed up as me being a little more frustrated with the people I was working with. Um, and really what I think that was is just, those are the signs and symptoms of, you know, my higher self saying, Hey, you know, it's time to go do something else, dude, like wake up, you know, and, and it just kept getting louder and louder. Right. So eventually I, my hard headed self woke up to that, that reality, even though I wasn't aware of it at the time, you know, I just sort of did it. I just started to change what I was going to do. So I, I left that field, sold my house, moved down to California from, from Seattle and and uh, started my own business in the health field. And that wasn't immediately successful. You know, it was sort of trial by fire in a huge way. And, and, uh, but I kept, kept going with it because I loved being an entrepreneur. I, uh, I wouldn't say an entrepreneur. I love being a, a, you know, self started business person. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was not an entrepreneur. I was just a business guy that was trying to figure out how to run his own business. And so, but I loved working my own hours, which meant 60 or 70 hours a week. Sometimes I love not having somebody tell me what to do, but having an unlimited ceiling, you know, I could go anywhere. You know, I felt like I had potential that was, through the roof. And also, you know, what I think is limited downside risk. So I, I just enjoyed that, that, that part of, of business and, you know, I enjoyed helping people. So that kind of just blossomed into what, what I'm doing now, which is more on the filmmaking side of things, more on the content production and, and education side of things. I've always felt like I was, I was meant to be a, some sort of a teacher. Um, okay. So what was, what was the stimulus there? Like what made you decide to do that and what did you decide to do? In terms of the film film side of things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, how did that idea brew? And how did you, like, say, okay, it's a cool idea. I'm actually going to go for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, really, I was working with a lot of clients and one-on-one, -on -one, right? And you, you know what that's like. Uh, our good friend Drew, you know, he, he, he knows what that's like. And, and, and at the end of the day, for me, working one-on-one -on -one with clients was, was a, an amazing experience to teach me my chops, to teach me what books couldn't mm -hmm. teach me or what the internet couldn't teach me. Um, but I, I just couldn't get the leverage that I wanted because I was working one-on-one. -on -one. And I realized I was kept teaching the same things over and over again. So, you know, I said, well, I need to teach this in a different way. And so uh, filmmaking, I, I, it just so happens that I have a, I have a friend who, who made a film. And I said, hey, we could do this, you know, and we could go travel the world, which we both want to love to do. You know, we could, we could create this project where we go around to these 100-year-olds all around the world and interview them and, and speak about health through the lens of longevity. And how lifestyle medicine is really a factor in, in that whole equation. Um, and so that's what we did. You know, we went to Icaria, Greece. We went to Sardinia, Italy. We went to Okinawa. We went to Costa Rica. And and interviewed all these, you know, 80, 90, and 100-year-olds to just discuss their life. And really, that was just an opportunity for me to take the, the knowledge and wisdom that I had gained in my health practice and and put it in the lens of, of somebody who's actually lived the life. And sure enough, they confirmed, you know, the, what, the things that they said that contributed to their healthy long lives were the very things I was teaching, you know, and there's a couple of things that, that, um, maybe I didn't put enough stress on. So I, I definitely learned a lot in that process, but it just allowed me to have that conversation in a fun way and create a film. And so 
um, it just became a, a sort of a, a fun thing for us to do. And, and it worked out pretty well such that we're working on our next film. One of the things that I love that you did in it so much, because I literally took notes. I felt like I was in like a, a certification a course dance. or something. It's a little I took notes on <laughs> Yeah. And I like rewatched some of the episodes because they were so good. But because what I loved that you did was that you so beautifully showed side by side, hey, here's some real practical wisdom mm -hmm. from somebody who actually did something that worked and has lived it. And here are all the like, in my opinion, a list health experts of like the dream list of everyone that I ever want to hear from and health side by side saying, actually, yeah, like this is why that has some validity because we know this, this and this, we may not know this. And then, you, you know, if we don't know it, then you had that wisdom right there from people who have lived it. It was just so beautifully done. Well, and and that's important. And that's important, right? Yeah. I think this is the problem right now with the Western society is that we have the internet, we have too much information, we have too little experience. You know, and this is, this is actually my problem with the whole longevity space in general, is that you have people preaching longevity, talking about how to live to 150. And they're 40 years old or they're 50 years old. And it's like, right. you know, dude, you haven't earned that yet. Like you, you don't really know what you're talking about. You're 50. You, <laughs> could, you don't know what it's like to get to, to 100 yeah. or 150, right? So to me, I couldn't talk about longevity and, without talking to the people who, who had done it, right? So it's sort of silly. We, we, we have all these, these experts out there that, that pretend to talk on certain topics and they ha they're not living their experience, right? Mm -hmm. it, it'd be like you teaching keto and you've never really even tried keto. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It, it's insane. Right. So to me, we need more people going through experiences and, and teaching their experience from their point of view uh, exactly. and nothing else, right? I mean, yes, we have the science and we have some of those things to back up, you know, what our experience has taught us maybe or help us explain it. But I think first and foremost, you have to have the experience and view things through your own, through your own eyes um, and realize that that's a truth for you, for your context, right? Especially in the health space, there is no uni. Well, there's not such a. There, there are there are few universal truths, and and after that, it's all personalized. It's all individualized based on the context. You know, the place that you're in, the state that you're in, the age. You know, all your experiences lead to the context of you applying something. So, to me, this is why we love going around the world is because we can talk about the context for each person and find the universalities, and also the uniqueness of each place and each person and their situation. And they all gave different answers on different things, um, except for the few core things that we all kind of understand. And, and for me, that's the places that we really need to leverage, you know, things like sleep, things like good relationships and, and having a connection to either nature or yourself, to other people, to God, whatever it is. Um, you know, there are certain pillars that we have to adhere to, um, you know, eating quality food from good quality soil. That's step one, right? Whether it's keto or vegan or it doesn't matter. First thing, first thing is, is it real food coming from real high quality soil that's not poisoned and, and destroyed? So right. these are the type of things that, you know, that, that we were able to sort of pick up and really stress. And then there was some nuance that we got to weave in because there's a ton of nuance in the health world. So I think it's really, really important for anybody listening to this to when you're trying to apply something in the health, whether it's health or spirituality, you know, whether it's a meditation practice, a kundalini, uh, could be plant medicines, could be, you know, breath work, whatever it is, try it, do it, you know, and then, and then realize what you're experiencing as opposed to just hearing somebody else's experience. That can be a great motivating factor. It can get us to take action, you know, to hear some of these things, but you have to do this stuff in order to realize what's really behind the curtain. Yeah. Beautifully said. I think one thing that we definitely share in common and that we talk about a lot is that we both like to go super science geeky on health, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. we want to know all the things, mm -hmm. right? We have that curiosity. Yeah. We want to be exposed to new ideas. What's worked for different people. As far as like, you know, I'm totally open to research and that side of things, science labs. And at the same time, I super value what some lady told me changed her yes. life because she stopped eating this one thing and it changed her whole life. Like that has yes. just as much value to me as huge the most advanced point. health ex expert. What's that? Yeah. I said, it's a huge data point, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Somebody that did something, it's like, Hmm, what, what's behind that? You know, what, right. what's there? That's very interesting. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's like this balance of, uh, science and information and real practical wisdom. And the other thing that I think we share in common <laughs> that we know, uh, we know we share in common is like on the outside, 
we are these, you know, health professionals and we like to work out and eat healthy. But uh, the side people may not know about us is we're kind of hippies. Like we're pretty, <laughs> we're pretty spiritual <laughs> and we definitely dive down that route. And so I think that it would be a disservice to not go into some of that with you today. Yeah. Um, especially in light. Stuff. Yeah. Especially in light of how we met um, in ayahuasca. I mean, that's such a incredible experience. And I'll never forget, Jason, uh, when you were like, <laughs> you were talking about all the changes that had happened in your life since the first time you had done ayahuasca. And I remember you just like smiling and saying, you don't even have to do anything. <laughs> I'll yeah. never forget that, you know, and it has been like amazing to see how in tune I have been on my mm-hmm. journey since October. I mean, it's just been unbelievable the the way my path has unfolded. And I think some of my audience has kind of seen that like, whoa, like what's going on with you, you know? Um, and so let's dig in. I'm not even really sure where to start here. I guess um, I would love to hear from you, like what it, what you're onto spiritually right now, mm-hmm. like what has been the most meaningful thing and what's like really resonating in your heart right now and the spiritual side of things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it started, I mean, things like ayahuasca, which are starting to become a little bit more popular now. Um, I first heard about it maybe 10 years ago or something, 12 years ago, maybe even longer. And, you know, I was interested right away just because of my personality. My personality is such that I like to go try freaking everything. Yeah. I like to try everything and see what's, see what's behind all this stuff. So I can feel like I can make better decisions going forward. And so this really, really intrigued me because it was, uh, you know, ayahuasca for those who don't know, um, is a combination of two plants used in the jungle primarily uh, that is used for healing in the jungle. And, um, you know, we, we view it as sort of a psychedelic drug. They would never call it that in, in any of the indigenous cultures that have been using this stuff for 5,000 plus years. Um, they use it for so many other things, healing families, healing an individual, spiritual growth, recognizing who we are, um, you know, essentially going back to, to the nature that is within all of us. And so um, we're starting to recognize the value of this in the West. And for me, when I finally did it, which was, you know, only three or four years ago, um, it radically shifted my perspective on on everything. And it just set me in a new trajectory Mm -hmm. of life. And um, it's hard to to put into words um, Mm -hmm. really how it shifts. But from from me, because I was such a doer before, right? Mm -hmm. This is and by the way, the, the cool thing about plant medicines for me is that it, it's it's really, really highlighted the archetypal nature of, of everything. So, you know, the doer is the masculine. That's the, the thinker, the doer, the masculine energy. And I think our society in the West suffers way too much of this masculine energy. And this is not a male-female thing. In fact, I would argue that the females are probably more hyper, hyper-masculine hyper than even the males. The males are actually starting to go more of the feminine route. Um but I think what we need to do is balance the masculine and feminine a little bit more. And that involves, for me, going to more of the being side of the equation, right? So instead of doing stuff, you can just be. And when you're in this being state, um, so much more magic can unfold. It's so much easier, you know? So yes, we need to do things. You know, that's an important part of where we're at. But we also need to balance that with the being. So for me, it really it allowed me to relax a little bit more into that being state. And then what I notice is that the universe, God, nature, whatever started giving me shit. It just started mm-hmm. placing things in my path, you know, mm-hmm. that I wanted or that I really valued or that I, that I could use. And so that was a really cool thing for me to become aware of was that, you know, I was, I've always been supportive and I don't have to do so much, you know, I can just relax into the flow and, and watch things come. Um, and so that, that was a really powerful lesson from the get-go. And so for me, this is really where it's, it's ever since then, it's just, it's taken me in, a, in an amazing direction that has to do with all kinds of the spiritual practice, you know, including more ayahuasca and, you know, using things like psilocybin to, to help other people resolve traumas, to help myself kind of have greater realizations. Um, but also really what I think is missing from a lot of the conversations in spirituality and plant medicines and all this stuff is the, is to ground this stuff right? To ground it in reality. A lot of people like to take these plant medicines or other psychedelics like LSD or, you know, even the sort of MDMA stuff and whatever it might be. And they like to escape, they use it to escape this reality, to escape their pains, escape their, their problems and, and, and numb things. Right. Um, 
in fact, one of my, one of the, the teachers that I respect highly in the sort of the plant medicine world, he's a, he's a Taita, his name is Taita Juanito, he's a, which is a very high spiritual master in, in Colombia. You know, he said that he's seen people take ayahuasca for 60 years and they don't change at all. They, they don't change. And he's seen people take ayahuasca once and it's all they needed and they radically shifted. So it all comes back to you doing the work here, you know, on planet earth, amongst your fellow humans, you know, with nature doing things. So to me, this is really where we need to start to, 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 to operate from is a grounded state of being that is embodied, right? That it's not escaping. And so for me, that's, that's really where my practice has evolved to is, is really become, trying to become aligned, uh, embodied and centered in, in my being so that I can operate in, 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 in a spiritual way as much as possible every day. Right. So I don't go do a spiritual practice. My whole life becomes a spiritual practice and it's embodied. So to me, that's the, that's the, that's a difficult path. Um, it's, it, it, I wouldn't say it's difficult. It just takes work. Um, yeah. so that's, that's really where I'm trying to, to live from as opposed to exploring the psychedelics and doing it. Cause I don't think it's they're necessary. Totally. You know, I mean, you mm-hmm. can, you can get mm-hmm. to the same places with meditation, with breath mm-hmm. work, with, with that, with finding teachers and mentors that they can help you get there as well. Um, but it becomes about, uh, being embodied. And so that's really where I'm placing so much of my focus now, even when I do these things like ayahuasca and other things, it's really comes back down to how can I embody this stuff? You know, how can I be this stuff every day? And that's really where the work is. You know, it takes a lot of courage to do things like ayahuasca and some of these other plant medicines, but, but the work is in the every day. It's in the, it's in the, the boring stuff. You know, it's in the, it's in the, the Thanksgivings with the families, right? Mm-hmm. You want to you find out how spiritual you are, go, go, go spend a weekend with your family. You know, that's, that'll, that'll show you all your mirrors. Uh, so that see, that's what you're talking about. Like <laughs> the wisdom, that's something that you've lived through because you have been the doer. Um, I remember you telling me about like when you, you had like a bad breakup and you were hitting the gym hard. And mm-hmm. I mean, having, yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone can tell that I've been there. Right. So, <laughs> um, so can you tell me what you learned from that? I thought it was so profound. Do you yeah, know what I'm talking really about? Wild. Yeah. 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 And in fact, this actually came from an ayahuasca uh, journey that I was in. And mm. uh, it's actually a specific kind of ayahuasca called Yehe, which is comes from the Colombian tradition. And, and, and this Yehe is a little bit more of a purgative. It's not so much psychedelic as some of the other ones, like the Santo Daime and other, other forms of ayahuasca. This one is much more purgative, which means you, you tend to vomit and shit a bunch. And that's the means by which you, you get rid of the, the belief systems, the, the, you know, all the lies and the traumas and the, just the dark energies, right? That's how you get rid of it. And, and I, I happen to be on the toilet, actually getting rid of, <laughs> you know, purging. And, mm-hmm. uh, as soon as, as it came out, I actually realized what, what I just got rid of. And it was this pain that I'd been carrying around from a breakup. And, and that was years ago. And at the time, and this hasn't been affecting me consciously, like it's not been in my psyche. In fact, it caught me off guard that that's what I got rid of. Cause I had no idea that I was hanging on to this. And, and it also, the medicine also showed me, um, why I was hanging on to it. And it, it, it was when the pain occurred, my method of coping with it, of dealing with it was to exercise. So I go to the gym, I do yoga, I run, etc. Instead of, you know, drinking or trying to numb it that way, because I knew that was unhealthy, right? So mm-hmm. at the time, I thought I was doing something really, really good for myself by, mm-hmm. by exercising. But the mm-hmm. medicine showed me that by using my body and not, not processing the pain uh, appropriately, I was actually basically holding on to the pain. That pain was being driven into my body, into my nervous system through the exercising and working out. So it's not a matter of, are you doing something healthy? It's how are you processing this information? You know, are you able to process the pain? And I, I, that, I wasn't, I was, I, in fact, I held on to it. So it was stuck in me mm-hmm. and it wasn't stuck in my psyche. It was stuck in my body, uh, you know, and, 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 and there's a lot of books out there that talk about emotions and and baggage that we that we store in in our body you know in our fascia in our mm-hmm. in our nervous system in our cells everywhere in our dna you know uh, a great one's called uh, the body keeps the score yeah. uh you know uh, bruce lipton talks about this as well uh and basically with the wisdom of our cells and cellular memory you know you have water scientists like gerald pollack talking about how water stores memory so there's all kinds of this information out there and, and that's what the medicine showed me that i was storing this information this pain this trauma in my body because i'd worked out so it was just a very 
fascinating lesson to learn that, you know, when we have these emotions, whether it's frustration or, or grief or anger or whatever it is, that there is a, a way that we need to process these things. My or else they can get stuck in the system. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was so profound. And obviously I relate because I mean, when I went through my divorce, I was pretty much living in the gym. Right. And mm -hmm. I also didn't have much of an appetite because I was so stressed from the divorce. And so yeah. I got really lean and it was a really interesting um, observation of society, actually, because I was heavily rewarded. For uh, exactly. I was just going to say that you got complimented uh, for all sure. All day, every day, everywhere I went, yeah. wow, you look amazing. I mean, I'm getting stopped in stores and I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I only ate half a of part of the day. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sick to my stomach, you know? So, um, that was interesting. Um, and I also have gone on this, you know, healing path and I, but I'm curious for you, like what, cause like, obviously you still work out, right? You still go to the gym mm. sometimes. Yeah. So you're yeah. Like, we're like, well, can't do that anymore. I'm driving pain into my body. So like, how did that balance come? Do you think it came spiritually first? Do you think you changed your habit? Like, how did that how did you come to mm. more of a place of peace out of that? Mm. Yeah, I think um, what I see is it's, it's, it's this back and forth, right? So what, for me, what I get on plant medicines, and I, you know, I've done ayahuasca a number of times now. So every time I do it, I learn something and I get the lesson. And then it, it's a matter of applying it, which doesn't always come through right away, right? So, so you get the awareness of something. For me, I get the awareness of something on the medicine. And then, and it's a deep understanding. It's an experiential wisdom. It's not like, it's not like reading a blog post. This is like deep, deep, you know, you, you experientially understand this on the medicine. Right. So, um, so it lands, um, mm -hmm. but it, it, again, it's putting it into practice. And so it's not always that I do that right away, but, but the nice thing is the awareness develops, right? So now I have the awareness of something. So, um, let's just say this doing versus being sort of a lesson that I learned, mm -hmm. um, you know, now, it, it, I, I still operate from the doing a lot of times. And then I just have to remind myself, oh, okay, you know, there's a balance here. And am I doing too much? Mm -hmm. um, so the awareness comes. But then also what comes with the awareness oftentimes is the self-critic, right? It's that little voice inside of us that says, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, you shouldn't be eating it, this brownie at 10 p.m. You know better, right? And that inner critic, once you develop awareness, the inner critic mm -hmm. becomes so much more powerful. So you have to be careful with this because, you know, you start beating yourself up if you don't start taking action of the things that you know you should be doing. But then there's the other part, which is the compassion behind that. that says, okay, you know, the, the critic is part of me and that's okay. Thank you for showing up. You're trying to protect me. You know, these type of things. And so it's sort of the self-talk or the self-awareness so that you don't beat yourself up for beating yourself up. Um, in fact, the medicine taught me that too. You know, medicine said, say, stop being so hard on yourself. You know, don't beat mm -hmm. yourself up. But then it came right back and said, but when you do, that's okay too, because that's part of being human. So don't beat yourself <laughs> up, and beat yourself up, right? Yeah. And I smile as this kind of comes through. These downloads come through, and it's beautiful. And so it's yeah. a constant reminder. So, so for me, it's a it's an iterative process. It's learning the lesson, becoming aware of it, failing to execute it, reminding myself, okay, here it is, and then moving, continuing to move through that, such that eventually you start to embody this stuff more and more. Because um, it's just like anything else, you know, when you try to change a habit oftentimes you're, you fail right away or you fail at some point in the process and then you kind of restart and you try to do it again. But at some point, you know, it sticks. And, you know, if you're trying to stop eating fast food, for example, you might fail a few times and you might go back to the fast food, but eventually you stick with it. You know, you, you know, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I don't even think about fast food. Like yeah. it doesn't even cross my own right. brain. I don't even know where they are in my right. city you know, because my, my, my brain doesn't even recognize it to right. some degree. So, it's that type of thing where you just kind of stick with it. And hopefully over time you start to embody these things. So, um, so for me, that's really what I've learned is these emotions as they come up, there's a way to sit and process it, um, you know, through my system in a healthier way. And, and I credit actually a lot to a couple of teachers that I have that are magical beings in and of themselves that have really showed me how to process things in my system, which is not in my mind. It's not, it's hard to explain, but it's actually through, through sort of my, my central channel, my system itself and how to operate from that point. Um, so it's, it's a constant evolutionary process, I think. Well, let's dig into that. Cause you said something, um, about when you do ayahuasca or you do one of these plant medicines, you're in one of these mm -hmm. experiences. It's not like reading a blog post It lands. Right. And that's mm -hmm. so powerful, but I know there are people listening if they're still listening that are like, 
well, I'm not going to do that. Like maybe their yeah. religion prohibits it. Maybe they just feel mm-hmm. way too uncomfortable. Like, let's talk about getting this stuff to land without using medicines, right? Which is something, I mean, I would say probably most of the time you're not using medicines when you're doing yeah. this work, right? So yes. like, what is an alternative and, you know, what would you recommend and what's your experience been? Yeah. And, and I think it's important to recognize that these medicines are just a fast track to get us yeah. to a con- a state of consciousness that allows us to be open to different energies. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what the shamans say, or the, the, the healers and the curanderos say is that, that, the medicine allows us to remember, right? It's what it's doing is it's, it's, it's not teaching us anything. You know, we remember, we're just remembering who we are, what we are, right? Which is nature, which is God, which is the eternal, right? So, um, and this goes back to a lot of spiritual texts, you know, um, even the Bible, I think talks about this and I'm no, you know, biblical scholar, but, but, you know, we have God within, you know? So, um, I think it's important to recognize that, that it's not about the medicine. The medicine is just, a way to get to this state of consciousness. In fact, a lot of the the healers, indigenous healers, you know, don't use medicines. They use drumming to get into an altered state of consciousness. So there's all kinds of ways to get into this altered state. Um, you know, you can do it through meditation. You can do it through drumming or rattling, which is what a lot of the the practitioners in the, in the sort of shaman space do. Uh, you can get it. You can get there through breathwork. Holotropic breathwork is a really, really great way to get to these altered states that allow you to sort of become more open to these receiving these sort of wisdoms or messages or understandings about yourself or about life or the universe or God or whatever. Um, that's another way. Uh, interpreting your dreams, getting really good and intentional at interpreting your dreams. That's a pretty dang, pretty dang good way. Um, you know, and then there's, there's teachers. This is a really, really important way to get there as well. Um, how do you find the right teacher? I don't know. I think you just kind of have to follow your path and listen to your heart or listen to your soul. But there are teachers out there that can help you show you how to get there naturally. Um, and, and, and a lot of times what I found is that you need an assist, you know, even in these lineages, you know, these indigenous cultures and these lineages, they have, there, there is the, the, what used to be common, this student teacher relationship, right? The apprentice, you know, that learns through experience from a teacher, you know, as children, we get these experiences from our parents, you know, and a lot of times these are vibrational frequencies. These are energies that we're receiving. Mm. They are, imagine a tuning fork. This is, this is the way I like to describe it. So imagine a tuning fork in your right hand and a tuning fork in your left hand. And you, you, you hit the tuning fork on the table with your right hand and it's vibrating it. I don't know, a C middle C. And if, if you have the same tuning fork, that's resonant in the left hand, it'll start vibrating as well. Right? So Nothing happened. Not, you didn't do anything with the left hand tuning fork, but yet the vibrational frequency is going through the air and it's resonating with the tuning fork on the, in the left hand. That's mm-hmm. what this, our systems can do. So when mom or dad has a vibrational energy of love or compassion or forgiveness or you know becoming a man or whatever it is, any kind of energy, um, we receive that in our system. So this is what a really good teacher can do is help give you these, these, these vibrations or these understandings from a system level. Um, that's what I've really benefited, benefited from in a huge way, um, uh, outside of sort of the plant medicine world. So there's, there's a lot of ways to get there. You know, Kundalini is a really good, a uh, good way. Um, there's, there's all the yogas, um, uh, more than just the asanas, right? All of us in the West, we're just doing the asanas, right? Which is just the poses of yoga. There's so many other branches of yoga. That, that, that teach. So there's a lot of ways to get there, but they all require you to participate and do the work. And I think one of the things that the medicine has really showed me is how important intention is. You know, we hear it. Oh, what's your intention? You know, if you go to a yoga practice, right? You'll hear what's your intention for this practice. I think a lot of people are saying this stuff, but I don't know that it's coming from a deep place of, of real experiential wisdom, like how important intention is. I mean, one could argue that intention is everything that it's everything with whatever you're doing. So, you know, the people who, who I've really respected, they show up with intention for everything that they do. And I just got shown in a, in a, in a, in a ayahuasca experience, how important that was. And, and it was a really important lesson for me to learn that it's not this, it's not an Instagram post about intention. This is 
deep, deep importance. What is your intention for today? What is your intention for this podcast? What is your intention for the yoga practice or the meditation or the, or the marriage or whatever it is? What is the intention? And it's an embodied intention. It's not a thought. It is connecting to the heart and connecting to the entire system, hopefully. Um, and that is really, really important. So I think if we have, we can show up with intention from a, a really deep place, then that's when the magic starts to unfold. So if your intention is to find one of these teachers, one of these healers, one of these spiritual leaders, these, these people who are really truly embodied, um, then I think you, you can find them. But that's really, I, I almost say I'm lucky to have found the, the teachers that I've found. Um, but, but I know it's not luck because it's been my intention for a long time to get to this place. And so, you know, what they say is that the teacher shows up when the student is ready, mm -hmm. right? And the student shows up when the teacher is ready, right? So, um, so I think it's just about continuing to do the work, allowing things to unfold naturally. And, and the thing that you can control is your intention. If there's nothing else you can control, it's intention. So to me, it's, it's really starting there and, and allowing the process to unfold naturally, knowing that you don't have to use these, these plant medicines or other psychedelic, uh, you know, drugs like LSD or anything like that to get there. You can get there naturally. Uh, you, you, we have it built into us. It's, it's a part of who we are. So, um, so there's a lot of ways you just have to figure out what is right for you and what's your path. Yeah. I love that. I I'm sitting here thinking as you're talking about, like, I'm like, what, where can people start? Like, what if they're hearing Jason right now? And they're like, well, this guy's nuts. something that, <laughs> yeah, there, I'm sure there's some of those. <laughs> um, but like, if something's resonating, you know, you're listening and you're mm -hmm. like, um, something about this is speaking to me, but you don't even know where to start. Like, I think for me, you know, I was raised religious. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not religious anymore, but when I was, I, I prayed a lot, you know, I was very I devoted to prayer. Way. Yeah. Yes. And so I think, and I still pray, you know, it's a little different way now, but I, every day I meditate, you know, and like you hear this thing, meditation, right? Everyone's talking about it. It's like, it's so yeah. hot right now, <laughs> but it's because I think the world is waking up and I think that's why it's hot mm -hmm. right now. But yeah. for me, like I've noticed that with my meditation, when I get outside of myself and stop being like, what am I going to receive? And what am I going to get? Right. And what's going to happen during right. this meditation or after? And like, and I just open myself up and say, let me be a vessel. Let me be a vessel. Yes. Like just yes. how can I serve? Um, I, I totally agree. And I'm sort of embarrassed I didn't say prayer. <laughs> yeah. I'm sort of embarrassed. I didn't say prayer because it's such an important part of this. And even in the indigenous cultures that don't have a, let's say traditional religious viewpoint, they still pray. They just pray in a different way. So I don't know that it has to have this connotation that a lot of us who maybe are more secular you know, that we carry with this idea of prayer, but prayer is so important. I'm so glad you said that. And, and also I, I totally echo your point. Um, in fact, a lot of the intentions that I have going into even plant medicines and, and meditations and other things is to be a vessel of truth, love, and healing for all beings. Mm -hmm. So this you are. allows me, <laughs> right. But, it, but it's beautiful because I'm included in that. Yeah. Right. So it's not a thing where this is another part where in the spiritual world, you see this a lot. You see people basically, there's so many ways to spiritually bypass, um, mm -hmm. which is to say that, Been you there. know, a lot of, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm still there. Right. And so yeah, yeah, um, yeah. a lot of what you see True. is people trying to heal others and help others and guide others and lead others. And they're really doing it as a way to, to heal themselves or to try to feel mm. like they're healing themselves. And so, mm. um, I think, it's really, really important to focus on you in a healthy way without excluding others. And so I think it's really, really important to get outside of yourself, as you mentioned, especially when you're feeling depressed, you're feeling anxious, you're feeling nervous, you're feeling any of those, those emotions, that's all self nonsense, right? It's too much focus on self. Mm -hmm. And so if we can just step back, like you mentioned, into meditation, into prayer and, and really open our heart for others, then it gets us out of our own way. And, and opens the door to so many more magical things. So I'm really, really glad you said that. And I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, these are things that are taught in like almost every religion. You know, I always look for truths and the things that are taught in like every religion. I'm like, well, that's yeah. gotta be some truth <laughs> right, right there. Right. Everyone's teaching cool. that. And it's always, you know, get out, get outside of yourself and serve. And then you just forget about yourself. And then you find that self love through through service, through being a vessel, through stop worrying about yourself so much. And it's, it's Absolutely. funny. It's funny, you know, like, I mean, we both know a lot of things about like health that can help with depression, you know, like I've had 
Um, like I had a client that had anxiety and depression really bad. That was really helped with keto. Um, I had, okay. and I think through like gut healing and I had another friend who had really bad depression and she's like, yeah, it doesn't really help so much, you know? And there's so yeah. many, so many factors involved. And I feel like this is why, you know, I, I, I intentionally named this podcast inside out health. Cause like, there's no way that we can be fully healthy. And I think everyone knows this, but there's no way we can be fully healthy if our spirit isn't healthy and it, it's just, just this two way street. You know, I think being raised in this American, uh, I don't know, like, uh, belief system that like, and, and maybe it, I don't know, has roots in like ancient Christianity. I'm not really sure where this idea came from, but that like our bodies are this like dirty, um, lower, um, like prone to sin, um, setback that we have to constantly overcome. And, um, you know, the, that we're like, it's this mind over matter mentality. And I really, I really reject that. Um, it's that, that was something that, um, I think my ego really liked, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I really felt like I, I, I had this amazing self mastery, you know, you know, I like to run marathons and I like to go all the way. Mm -hmm. And there is va there is value in that. Um, there is some value in being able to train your spirit past the point of comfort so that you can grow. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I have found so much value in like nurturing everything inside of me, whether that's like my, the systems of my body down to my cellular level to my spirit that's inside, you know? And so, well, it's a balance, right? You, you, it's it's all part of the same package, right? Yeah. There is no separation, right? Between body spirit, they're all one and the same, just sort of different densities or different representations of the same thing, which is basically the formless, the the nameless, the, the you know the thing that doesn't even exist. So um, there's an essence, there's an idea that is you that is manifested as as such, and so I think you cannot separate them, and I think it's foolish to put put too much weight in one or the other. And so, um, you know, if you, if you don't take care of the body vessel and you only focus on spirituality and all this stuff and, you know, more towards the, the ascetics that would, you know, hardly ever eat these type of things, that's not the way forward. It's just going to cause suffering, right? And this is the, the teachings of the Buddha himself and, and, and vice versa. We place too much, fo uh, focus on the physical and we don't develop emotionally or spiritually or mentally, um, we're going to suffer. So, so to me, it's, it's about the whole package and, and you, you know, you kind of, you mentioned how do people start? I mean, honestly, listening to podcasts like this is a starting point, you know, just mm -hmm. opening yourself up to these conversations, opening yourself up to these ideas, letting go of some of the belief systems, just being open. And it doesn't mean accept it. It just, it means be critically open, yeah. you know, open, but critical, mm -hmm. put it on the shelf. You know, if it doesn't resonate with you yet, or, or you're not sure about it, put it on the shelf. Or if it does resonate, it put resonate, put it on the shelf and then try it. Right. So I think just opening yourself up to these ideas. Um, and then, continuing to to have an intention um that that is pure that is from the heart mm -hmm. and if you have those intentions and you can remain open then i think you start getting out of your own way and, and things start unfolding you know one of the actually the, the the really important lessons that um i was taught recently on the medicine um on on ayahuasca um was to respect process the, the medicine showed me that process is divine mm -hmm. itself it is it weaved that. or woven into the very fabric of nature so there is you accept process don't and flow with it you know because any any attempt to avoid or skip steps mm -hmm. will only cause suffering so to honor and respect process there is a process to getting older there's a process to developing as a child there's a process to you know developing in the womb there's process to how the earth is evolving there's process everywhere it is a part of everything and we're we're judging everything you know we're 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 happy we, we create these judgments that things need to be changed or fixed or whatever mm -hmm. and and the medicine show me no, no no it's not like that mm. it's all process mm. and if we just allow the process to unfold and and recognize that it's not all you know rainbows and, and unicorns that it's all process then we stop suffering and because we're not fighting and judging the process we're accepting it and allowing it flowing with it so to me this is very much a personal journey of, of allowing the process of your own, of your own development, of your own spiritual awakening, of your own emotional development to, to flow and stop trying to put a pause, to pause it, stop trying to, uh, to change it or to, to, to skip it or anything like that. Just accept it. And, and you're going to move through it and with it so much easier without pain, without, without, uh, suffering. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and this actually goes to another, uh, 
<laughs> lesson that I learned on the medicine. Um, it, it, it showed me very clearly, uh, or made me feel really very clearly that pain itself is healing in disguise. Pain is healing in disguise. I love that. Wow. That's profound. Pain is different yeah. than suffering. <laughs> pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Um, and so if we accept the pain is the first part of the healing, right? That is the, that is the thing that's showing up, showing you that there's something out of balance. So any pain in your life, recognize that it's, you know, to, to appreciate the pain, to have gra gratitude for the pain and recognize, try to search where the pain is coming from. Ultimately, truly where it's coming from, not, not it's coming from my knee. No, no, no. Showing up in my knee. It's coming from somewhere else, right? Like likely it's, it's a psycho spiritual trauma, some sort of emotional trauma, something like that. So pain is, is beautiful. And so if we can, if we can learn to accept it and, and understand its role in the healing process, um, then we can begin to heal. If we keep fighting it, denying it, trying to push it away, not accepting it as ours, you know, then it's going to persist and it's going to keep reminding you, no, 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 <laughs> there's something here. You got to figure out what it is. Right. So, um, so I think this is, if we can start to accept this stuff and allow it to unfold naturally and, and just operate, uh, uh, put intention to operate from the heart space, you know, um, then I think on living from the heart, then it, it all starts to unfold naturally. You know, you don't have to try to do so much. You just, you just operate from that state of being in the heart and, and, Things unfold in ways you can't imagine. I mean, look at, look at your life right now. I this applies to anybody listening. Can you imagine if you look back 15, 20 years ago, how things would, how things unfolded for you? Never. Right? And all the pains and all the trials and all the crappy stuff that happened. Undoubtedly, you can see that there was a point to it and that it got you to a certain realization, really? certain understanding in your life that you're likely grateful for. And if it hasn't happened yet, it will. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, so I think we, we don't know where we're at in the process. <laughs> you know, we don't have the, the, the foresight to see the whole picture, you know, where right. we can only see what we see. Uh, but that's another important aspect too, is that, um, you decide what you see. Yeah. You know, there's um, duality and in everything for sure. <laughs> wow. Jason, that is so profound. I, I wish we could go on and on forever. I have to get on another podcast or I just be like, yep, this is going to be a two hour episode. <laughs> um, where can people find more Jason? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, the, the human longevity project is really our, our kind of focus now. Um, we're actually releasing that film. It's a film series, nine part film series. We're releasing that um, in June for free on the internet. Oh, so you wow. can go to human longevity, human longevity film.com um, and just register there to, to watch it. And we'll let you know when it's, it's airing. Um, and this is actually the last time we're going to show this. Uh, oh, wow. so guys, it's, it's going to last option before we move on to the next stuff. Oh, wow. Guys get it, get it because like, don't like do it right now, <laughs> open your phone or whatever and sign up for it because it's like a shortcut to how all the very high level people in the health industry think like you've got it all summed up on there pretty much. So yeah. it's, and we cover, yeah, we cover a lot of topics you yeah. know and we, oh, we talk much. about a lot of spirituality today but it's not a ton about that it's more about yeah. the microbiome it's more about mitochondria about you know intermittent fasting and um you know heat hot and cold therapies it's about circadian rhythms and uh, it, raising children you know uh, the birthing processes um a little bit about spiritual stuff in, in terms of emotional traumas and that kind of thing but um this is more focused on healing the the mental emotional physical side of things and we try to incorporate as much as we could, um, and explain it. Right. Yeah. So uh, there's some deep science and, uh, you know, if you like to geek out, uh, I'm telling you, it's yeah. pretty good for that. It is so good. So good. Okay. And then, so human longevity film.com is where they sign up for that. Yep. yep. So they can find that there and then they can find me on social media, just at, at Jason Prawl, um, on Instagram or, or, you know, Facebook. Um, they can follow us at human longevity project on Facebook as well. Okay. Find me there. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. It's a pleasure.